So where do we where, where do we want to begin? Maybe maybe start with some questions. Yeah, questions from the floor. Yep, um, Liana, I got your name correct this time. Greetings to both speakers. Thank you for uh, imparting your knowledge to us. My name is Liana, and I would like to direct a question to Professor Chang. Okay, uh, throughout this week. Uh, Southeast Asia has experienced uh, a relatively extreme weather and temperatures have dipped to the lower tw 20s. So as climate change uh, is becoming more apparent, uh, how should architects uh, face this? Uh, because you talked about uh, tropical architecture, but in this case we have post tropical uh, architecture to consider. So what is your comment on that? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, I, I think the normative answer, let me give you the normative answer first. The normative answer is that climate change um, is happening and uh, we don't deny it. And, and, and as, as architects, we have, buildings are actually responsible for a pretty big percentage of carbon emission. Maybe not just the construction of building, but the operation of building. So if architects can design a more energy efficient building, then that will be very helpful. So that is a normative answer to that question. And I don't, agree, I don't disagree at all with this normative answer. But, uh, but, but, but I'm also trying to say that um, because climate is now, as you say, um, there are more uh, greater frequency of extreme weather events. So it's not just about architecture responding to, 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 to climate and and so I think a more kind of a complex um, discourse about what kind of um, new climatic architecture um, is necessary is maybe, uh, what kind of new climatic architecture is maybe needed at this point. That's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, not quite, but I just want to bring that topic up. Okay. Which, which, which is the part that you think I didn't answer? Uh, the, the exact uh, steps or things that architects should consider say uh, maybe in 30 years um, Malaysia would experience blizzards you see you're, 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 I'm a historian I'm not a futurologist <laughs> so a, a historian um, and, and I'm not a I, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to say that, but as a scholar, I'm, not, uh, I'm a critical historian. As a critical historian, we are a bit wary of um, giving the kind of instrumental advices uh, of what, what ought to be done. Yeah, for us, it's, I think more important role as a critical historian is to provide alternative frameworks and understanding of looking at things. So I think your answer can be quite adequately addressed by the normative um, response to... to looking at climate change and architecture and I, it's something that I don't disagree with and I think also that is the, the, the right thing to do. I have, because I happen to be a historian who teach design studio too and I, I also used to um, co-lecture something on sustainable architecture. So it's something that I, I, I tell my students is incredibly important and, and you should do it. But you see architecture can only do so much. I know, are you an architect? No. Okay, good. So. Um, I think sometimes architects try to do too much. Um, it's not just um, about the architects, it's also depending on you know, certain social conditions, the clients and so on and so forth. It's also about government regulation. So, so it's, a, it's really about architects uh, op cooperating with society at large to, to deal with this problem. I think architects as a profession is not able to really deal with um, this, this problem, especially when you have someone, for example, like Donald Trump who pulls USA out of the um, Paris Climate Accord. I mean, so so obviously you need the state to be involved in this. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Could I could I perhaps sort of like um, add on to that by asking a related sort of like question? So it's uh, I mean, given that both of you sort of like engage with history from different sort of like approaches, it it's kind of sort of like implicitly suggested that. Um, that uh, you know the, the, the topics that you deal with is an engagement uh, has a strong engagement with sort of like techno science, right? Which is built into the epistemology or the system of knowing or, or uh, of knowledge or of modern architectural sort of like practice, and um, not simply as an emergent sort of like feature in urban planning, bandied under what is called smart cities today. 
So I was wondering, actually, it might be sort of like related to what, what do you think of uh, like all this discourse around sort of like smart cities today and whether your study of the history of techno science and history of technologies that goes into um, refashioning the built environment might offer different sort of like tools of understanding the kind of rhetoric that goes on with urban planning of the present day. Um, most, most historians who look at history of technology um, will take a pretty critical approach to what is called technological determinism or technological romanticism. That means there is a, a kind of a romanticism about what technology can change. It's as if, if you have the correct technology, then all these social problems will go away. But um, history has tell us that um, technology in and of itself is really not enough. I mean, there are certain good technology with good intention, but they, they fail to um, create the necessary type of um, um, social technological changes. So I think there are many factors involved. So as a historian, I would say that um, there's maybe a lot of investment and a lot of interest in what technology can do, and understandably so, uh, partly because you know the very modernity that we live in, um, a lot of it is really enabled by um, new technological um, changes and transformations. So it has really enabled a lot of modern conveniences, modern comfort. So I can totally understand why we invested so much faith in what technology can do. But, but I, I would say that you know, if you actually look at not just um, smart cities, but eco cities as well, um, many of them turn out to be really not working. So, so, so as, a, as a historian, sometimes I, 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 because I'm actually a very marginal position within the curriculum, so I, I tell my students that you know, I'm like the tabloid newspaper. I look at uh, controversial cases in which um, technology fail. I look at um, um, uh, um, all kinds of uh, strange things whereby technology didn't work as expected. I, I can do that and I'm afforded the luxury to do that, partly of course because I'm in ivory tower and academia. But the main thing is because most of my colleagues are, are teaching technological courses and telling students that oh, technology can do this, can do that. So, so my role as a historian is to maybe dig out cases from the past or even from the recent one whereby you know, technology d really didn't deliver as it, as it promised. Yeah. Say to them. I, I just can only nod, nod and say it's a very important role uh, because I think. I think uh, sorry, the sorry. museum has. Uh, <laughs> the museum has. Um, I guess in a way, our audience is something that is. Um, how do you say this? We're not serving a profession in that sense, or, or training. You know, we are just. But you can you can also say it's about training. How do you say this? Okay, not a specific role like the academic, uh, which means that we are. I guess in some time we have the we have the freedom. Um, to be able to tell stories that don't necessarily, um, but the thing is, you have that freedom too. You're able to tell dystopic stories as well of technology, uh, and I guess for us, uh, it's important that we go for both <laughs> or the entire spectrum um, because uh, um, I think it's something that we, yeah, it's a it's just a very different storytelling format, right? We don't. I mean, if, there, if there's ever, which I mentioned to Jahui before, if there's ever uh, an exhibition on tropical architecture, you know, how would we choose to deal with it in a way that's different from how you have researched the topic, let's say, you know, like it's, it might just completely be determined by what we are able to find or, or maybe determined by pretty much, you know, like a notion of like what is the populist stance, but at the same time, what is the critical stance all at the same time. And so it's, yeah, so I think it's both. But yeah. I think as a museum and as, a, as an institution like M+, um, your strength would be in communication. And also you reach out to a lot, of a much bigger audience. A lot of those things that we do in academia, you know, the readership is very small. I mean, the, 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 the people that really read our stuff. And also, we make it very difficult for our stuff to be readable. <laughs> you know, we, we use obscure languages, we, we, we chose theories that are... That are that are so hard to understand. Yeah. So, so we are poor with com communications. Yeah. No, but I think, but the thing is, uh, you guys have the gems here yeah, to really. I mean, for us, it's just a matter of how do we mediate those very hard ideas. I think, I think some ideas are really important, and we almost want to communicate it. But it's more of the how. And so, I think, I think you are closer to the evidence, you know, or, or the thinking or the theories behind it. I think for us, it's almost like how do we extract that in a way, selectively, in a way that really is relevant to certain audience. And so, I think, or certain times, I think, I think it's. I think it's a great. Is there really a, is, uh, a certain, uh, uh, 
us and them sort of instead, like divide. Instead, actually, yeah. um, I mean, to, to, uh, I imagine that the academic uh, academic world and the curatorial world also work collaboratively on many. I think it has to. I mean, there's just no way that I think like what. We just there's just no way for us to look at objects in a like zzz, like deep zoom in mm. sort of way. You know, we are we are kind of like crowd we kind of crowdsource things mm. or we have to look at broad sweeps. Uh, but then we rely on the literature to even understand what these things yeah. are. And so I think we yeah we are high, so I, I guess a lot of the works that we acquired that may not have some of them may not have been studied before and that we just have to make a very instinctual kind of assessment of what this might mean mm -hmm. uh, to the public. And then from there also archives are meant to be accessed and therefore. For the for the academia or whoever researcher to come and and, and, mm. and look at them, uh, so MPAS doesn't just acquire things for display, but for study as well. Okay. So I guess that's that's the whole goal. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can I take a second question? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Wayne. Uh, hello. Uh, um, I'm Li Wang Choi. Uh, I have a, a question also for Dr. Chang. If you could uh, please elaborate on the Taking Soon debates. Because what's interesting there, it, as from what I understand with uh, Taking Soon, is he doesn't necessarily take a techno science kind of position. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to elaborate on that, uh, also given the uh, bulk of your presentation. Thank you. Sure. So, um, um, so the, firstly, a clarification um, the King Soon's and uh, Chan Su Kian's debate. I was using it as a starting point. Um, I'm actually not really analyzing it as part of the kind of historical narrative. So King Sun's claim is a, a pretty straightforward one. He's a product of the 1950s and 60s uh, decolonizing moment. So as a student then, what his teacher, um, Mr. Lim Chong Kiet, um, um, was one of them, and, and a group of students, what they were trying to do was to create a Malayan architecture. And at that time, uh, one of the way for them to put forward a Malayan architecture, given the multiculturalism and also um, the fact that you know, Malaya was a colonial plural society that comes with its own kind of ethnic tension, was to look at um, a, a source that is a lot more neutral. And, and for them, the environment was something that was quite neutral. It avoided, for example, if, if let's say they're going to follow the Thai and the Laos example of applying certain kind of ornaments or to, to refer to um, certain historical monuments, then there will be a question about which type of historical monument should they look at and, and what other historical monuments should they exclude? So there's a question of the relevance of the symbol and the relevance of the motifs and ornaments for, for, for contemporary architecture. So they, avoid, they, they try to avoid that by not really wanting to talk about that aspect, but instead they go back to what they call, what they regard as the essence. And, and at that time, the essence of it was what they call the love of the land and environment was part of that. So for them, what they extracted from studying uh, vernacular architecture and even colonial architecture was that they all responded in particular manner to, to the climate. So, so for him, that, that was pretty important. So that, that, that was how he was trained as a student in the 1960s and subsequently some of his works were designed that way. And then in the 80s and 90s, he produced, um, he, he produced a set of writing thinking about, um, and by the 80s was a slightly different debate. In the 1980s, there were um, a, a number of symposium, a number of seminars that were organized in relation to the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. So in 81, I think there was a, a symposium, um, seminar held in Kuala Lumpur here about architecture and identity. So at that time, there was again another set of discussion about if we, it was a, it was a response to the so-called failure of modernism and the modern, modernist city. So for them is that, okay, if modernism and modern city based on the Western model has failed us, has created this urban crisis and architecture crisis and representation, what would be the alternative? So there was various position being staked. Um, in, in that debate. The one that I showed earlier uh, was Ken Yang, a Malaysian architect, um, uh, together with King Sun. For them, again, they returned back to what they call the environment as the source. And, and that was also, I think, partly in response to uh, a, a political pressure at that time exerted by um, um, PM Mahathir, um, saying that all tall buildings should have Minangkabau roofs or something like that, or, or, or they should you know, look at the traditional Malay house and try to introduce the forms to the traditional Malay house, as I understand it, or at least King Sun presented it that way. So for them, 
again for, um, for, for him who was um, educated at a time of uh, Malayanization and having a kind of a multicultural Malayan consciousness, that for him was wrong. So he, he didn't want to again resort to ethnic symbol. So for him, he developed this thing of um, an architecture aesthetic of tropicality. And he called it line, age, and shade. Line, age, and shade is really um, in contrast to the Western modernist uh, language, which is about uh, volume, plane, and light. So, so he said that in the tropics, this will not work because building physics means that if you have a box that is, that is, um, that is unsheltered, that, that is un unprotected, then the box will get heated up and, and the environment doesn't work. And instead of having, so, so instead of having a box which is the volume and instead of having plane, he will have line and edge. And instead of having light, we should, have, uh, we should celebrate shade. So that was the architecture aesthetic um, that, that he actually advocated. And I think he wrote it up in late 80s or early 90s. So that became pretty influential. Uh, um, many people uh, bought into that, and it was uh, published as a monograph, and it became quite influential. And it was called the architecture of tropicality or something like that. So a younger generation of uh, architects came after him, and among them was Chan Su Kian. Uh, so Chan Su Kian was, of course, as architect, you always need certain kind of aesthetic breakthrough. It's like the artist, you want to break away from the past generation, you want to do something new. So, so um, Chan Su Kian came from a, a different kind of educational background. For him, there wasn't that, uh, that political burden of thinking of, of, of um, breaking away from a kind of a colonial discourse of, of tropical architecture or, or thinking about Malayanization at all. So for him, it was purely an aesthetic gesture. So for him, um, new tropicality is really taking on the, 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 the new plastic form of modernism um, in, in, in Europe and then trying to, to to, to rework it aesthetically yeah, in terms of material and things like that. So therein is uh, the debate and, and also the difference in opinion between the two of them, representing views from different generations. Thank you. I wonder if we can, I, I can sort of like piggyback a bit on that sort of like question because you're dealing a lot with this idea of tropicality as a sort of like term, but I want to shift it to this idea, th this qualifier that we keep sort of like throwing out in this symposium for the whole day, this idea of the modern, right? And especially in relation to um, Shirley's talk just now where you, are, you, you have sort of like pressed us to sort of like re, to reconsider what modernism or modernity could sort of like potentially mean. Uh, and I was wondering if um, you've heard of this, um, uh, I guess a Japanese scholar or educator by the name of Ojiro Kon, who's coined this term called modernology. Um, sometime in the mid, uh, after the war, after the Kanto earthquake, at least in 1923, where he used this term to sort of like describe a kind of disciplinary or sort of some kind of a field of study that relates, say, modern architecture or modern cities to the people of Japan. Is that something that you have come across in your research here on Japanese modernism? You say modernology. Modernology. So that's a very specific sort of like. Japanese branch of the study of, say, modern architecture in relation to cities and people. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm not a, I mean, I would not have, you know, if, yeah. I mean, for you and, and Jiahui, you would have read all the key texts, you know, like, uh, I think for us... And this is something I just came across on, on Wikipedia. But the question of what the historians term as something, like, you know, a term, mm. versus how, I guess for us, we look at practice mm. and examples or the works that come out of practice and the kind of even the discourses that these architects are actually a part of they somehow are not as influenced. This is just my very surface mm -hmm. observation of the Japanese architects. They don't, they don't engage with the historians per se. They are two different schools. Mm -hmm. They are much more influenced by what was happening by the exchanges with the institutions, so-called, whether it's in Harvard and all that. So, I mean, these are the exchanges that were happening much more, whether it's the kind of books that they read or the kind of mm. co-authoring or, or articles that they publish, which magazine, you know, these are all, they're all part of a discourse that belongs to that, that side. Mm -hmm. And not so much with the local architectural historian. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe Terunobu Fujimori would be a different one mm -hmm. because he himself is, a, is a, you know, also a historian, but also a practitioner. That's why he's able to build something so completely out of the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I, think, I think it's just, uh, so I, I, I would not have, um, I would Someone not think like that uh, Wang, Ta Wei, Wang, Ta, Wang Ta Hong, Wang Ta Hong would yeah. not have, say, drawn on the findings of, say, Liang Sicheng <laughs> and things like that. It, so he would Liang Sicheng, uh, yeah, because Liang Sicheng is, uh, if you want to look at when he started writing and publishing, yeah. it was pretty much 
majority are published after the founding of the nation, so called mm. after 49. Uh, yeah. uh, whereas at that point, uh, Wang Tahong's major was influences was he was still studying in, in, in Harvard. And when you come to China or uh, Taiwan, back to Taiwan, what would be the contact? You will not get these texts mm -hmm. coming from Liang Sicheng. And Liang Sicheng's uh, classical uh, or, or voc okay, vocabulary, structural vocabulary or traditional architecture was only published in English much later as well, disseminated. I think it's in the 70s or 80s. Yeah, the, the key texts of all his studies were only published much later as well. So in that sense, there was no, the discourse did not, go, did not move over to Taiwan. It remained as something within within the PRC, mm -hmm. so, it's, uh, so the contact isn't, isn't right. there as well. Was, yeah. was there ever a point in which some of these local historians then get picked up, maybe in a post-POMO kind of like phase, local or historians. maybe a later kind of like period? In oh, you mean the role of the historians in affecting practice? Yeah, or well, a, a local well, historian, or a local thinker, or something like that, because now you're saying that the coordinate is more sort of like east-west, right? More global and different sort of like, it's a different kind of like flow. In uh, could it I, be a kind of like delayed yeah, there, there kind is of a, like There reception. is, you can say, almost a dominant force yeah. that is coming from elsewhere. Even in China, uh, in the 80s, there were all these Jenks books that were just pub trans translated into Chinese and it led to major misinterpretation. Okay. Um, and, um, and so, in a way, yeah, they were looking up to these sources from outside, but whether they understand whether it was translated correctly or understood correctly, it was completely decontextualized. Uh, and there were proof of that, <laughs> the decontextualization of what POMO actually meant. Yeah. Um, and so I guess you could say, yes, there was an influence, but whether it was an unexpected or false type of influence, you know, it's, yeah, that happened. But I think in terms of, uh, I think discourse for architecture in China it was really, I think it was very influential in the 49 because the journal, the architectural journal, which is the only journal in socialist China were very influential. It was all, I mean, it was all debated every day. It was very much part of the uh, nationhood and citizenship, right, um, as a new nation. And so these articles in the journals really influenced practice like almost immediately. So I would not say that they are historians per se, but they are practitioners writing t to each other and about each other's work that really affected, uh, almost determine your, your life and death and whether you're in or out. Um, yeah, this, the self-critique movement was really de detrimental actually to a lot of practitioners in the late 50s. So it's, yeah, it does affect them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, can I have another question from the floor? Is there another question? We have the microphone. No. No other question? Yeah, uh, Chitu? Um, my question is for Jadwi, actually. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any sort of um, debates in the architecture world about, you know, sustainable architecture, which is, you know, very sort of hip right now in Southeast Asia, especially in the tropics and all. Um, because for me, it seems like um, the idea of sustainable architecture the products of which are usually only probably enjoyed by the rich and the upper class types, um, who sort of you know aims to build homes that are a bit more sustainable and all environmentally friendly. But wouldn't the path to sustainability to be just to reduce uh, consumption and and you know lead simpler lives in much smaller homes as opposed to huge houses that you know, are green in that sense. Can you elaborate on these debates if there are such debates going on? I, I think there are many shades of sustainable architecture just like there are many shades of environmentalism. So there's been an accusation by an Indian writer. Um, I, I can't remember his name, but I need to check. Uh, he was talking about a lot of environmental discourse or environmentalism is really about bourgeois environmentalism. It's the middle class who are really interested in protecting the environment. Then he argued that you know there is another kind of environmental um, environmentalism that is much less discussed, which he called empty val empty belly environmentalism or environmentalism of the poor. So when we talk about the environment, um, it, it it doesn't really just affect the wealthy; it affects the poor in other ways. So for example, many of the squatter settlements in the world, whether they are favelas or kampongs, they tend to be built on vulnerable sites, sites that are vulnerable to um, let's say flooding or to landslides because the favela tends to be built on land that um, people don't really want to build, so they are built on very steep slope. So it's not as if the poor are not affected by uh, their set of environmental problems. 
And in, in, in that book, uh, Environmentalism of the Poor, I thought it was really interesting in that they actually reframe what environmental, uh, what our concern about the environment should be. It should be about how it affects um, you know, this uh, large proportion of very poor people in developing countries and how we should shift our focus to address not the kind of, um, you know, a, a lot of middle class or North American and, and European environmental, environmentalism is about um, buying something and, and feeling good about it. It's about ethical consumption, uh, ethical consumerism. Not that it's wrong, but, but that on its own um, doesn't really, like you say, address the root of the problem, which is to reduce consumption. So he says that, um, or the, the, the author of the book says that we, we should then focus on other more urgent issues that really impact um, the poor. And, and there, are, there are questions that are really about affecting their livelihood, affecting um, how they, 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 they live. So environmental toxic, environmental pollution, and, and things like that should be looked at from that kind of angle. So I, I think there is really a kind of a worthwhile um, angle to look at. And architecture has responded to that by um, looking at um, disaster relief architecture, for example, looking at um, helping the poor to improve their squatter settlements, um, um, improving basic dwellings and things like that. So there is a diversity of sustainable architecture. Sometimes when we, when we look at the city, especially a very affluent city like Kuala Lumpur or like Singapore, then the, the focus tends to be a lot more narrower. It, it tends to be about fulfilling certain um, green rating system and then getting a, a kind of a, a, a label or a certification of your building. But then there are other issues that I think will impact, that will impact um, um, the, the masses and, and would be quite worthwhile doing. So I, I don't think we should be um, too cynical about sustainable architecture, but we can be critical about what it stands for and how it can actually do more because we can't deny the fact that climate change is indeed going to have a big impact on society. Um, can we have one last question from the floor? Yes, please. Uh, do you mind waiting for the mic? Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what, my, what the answer is going to be, but it's for the three of you. Um, I have been conducting some research not relevant to what you've spoken about, but it keeps going back to modern sensibilities and modern thought um, in regard to um, the unsustainable life, life that we have created globally and um, how modernism and modern sensibility has overreached um, the capacity of nature. And so what would you think, what do you think about um, modern thought, modern sensibilities are no longer necessary for collective living and how it's not contemporary for what's happening to the globe. So what do you think about that statement that to the reliance on technology, like you were saying before, in, my, in your classes, people are, um, you talk about technology, can do this, do that, or for example, I lived in San Francisco for a while and people think an app is going to fix homelessness, right? Um, so, but that's very modern to think that technology will, will fix it. So what do you think about the statement that, um, that I've come across in my research that modern thought and sensibilities are no longer relevant to contemporary society? That's, that's kind of like a counterpoint, no? <laughs> no but it's, uh, um, do you want to start? It's really hard because I mean, I almost wanted to. It's a big question. Ask, sorry. You know, I almost wanted to ask, like, what, what would you, how would you define the modern in that, in that questioning? Right. Yeah. Modern sensibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the word. I mean, if modern is current, if modern means a hegemonic way of like advancement, you know, is the only way. Let's say, yes, it is problematic, right? Like, it's not the only way. So, I mean, you brought up, I mean, I mean like, for example, like, uh, there are architects like, uh, I mean, the one that, that I, I happen to know a little bit more of in, in Indonesia called Eko Prawoto, he is going even further and further into the rural. <laughs> I don't know whether it's like an escape, but he is beginning to realize more and more, I don't think I need to rush or to build or design something that needs to um, um, almost like, uh, almost, almost to force the people that I'm designing for to adapt to the urban. But I'll just, I just want to let whatever that's happening in the rural to stay as they are. In fact, I want to cultivate that so that it can be sustained. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I, I, see, I see it is impossible to, to get rid of it because the system and the structure is already 
is already about advancement, you know, it's already about progress in that sense. I mean, the city still have to move on, you know, but I think, but I think I'm just saying that I think we should allow a lot more, a lot more di di diversity, I guess, in terms of uh, ways of progressing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so especially not right now, uh, there are certain parts of, of the world that are still to do with the, the urban is still the, the better way, right. whether it's in China, India, or in Indonesia. So, uh, so in, that, in that kind of situation, uh, that's when there needs to be another way, also, a, a way in which they both could co coexist. I guess you know. So I, I don't think it's an either or thing, but that it should they should allow for a different kind of existence. Yeah. Um, maybe one way to frame the mo the, the the modern movement is through um, or, or modernism is through um, what James Scott uh, wrote. James Scott is a political scientist. He wrote this book called Seeing Like the State, and then he he came out with this term called high modernism. High modernism is really the kind of um, modern planning. Uh, uh, whether is it planning of the cities or, or you know mapping of, of places that, that, that came up um, after um, after the Second World War, the post-war decades, whereby there's a lot of um, simplification, a lot of a reduction of how the, the complexity of society. So it became a way that that created all kinds of issues and problems. So if we actually look at high modernism at, uh, and, and maybe some types of um, post-enlightenment ideas about how man can dominate society, dominate nature and how men and women, not just men, but human beings can dominate nature, then of course there are some problem with that in terms of this uh, lack of environmental sensibility. But there's already an earlier wave of reacting against that. So if you look at the countercultural movement in North America and Europe, it was in a way a, a response to that, a critique of mainstream high modernist society, if you like, and, and trying to find alternative ways to, to, to live um, in a maybe environmentally more appropriate ways. So they, they, there was also a series of books, for example, like um, thinking about um, small is beautiful, um, re rethinking how technology can be not the kind of capital labor intensive technology, not centralized technology that depends on um, a lot of expertise, but um, technology that can be a bit more dispersed, diffused, and maybe indigenous technology that can deal with it. So there's a whole uh, discussion about that. You know, the problem with, is that when you ask historian, we always give you historical precedence. So we, we are not able to talk about future. We can say that, oh, the future has been thought about this way in the past. But, but we don't really know about the future, but the future has been thought about that way in the past. Yeah, so so that, that, there, there has been an interesting moment in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. No, I'm very familiar with the, the movements in Northern California and the collective livings and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. But to see its failures is important too. Uh, so I think this Absolutely. historical lessons, its failures means that you can't really create your own, I mean, how possible is it? How long can you actually create your own utopia? Yeah. Also, I mean, it's a question, so. Well, you end up having the same problems <laughs> with people. Yeah. Um, oh, you want me to give Ray join there as well? Do yeah, I have to I, respond to it? You don't have to if okay. you want to. <laughs> but, I mean, principally, I agree what, with, uh, with what both of them have really um, said, but uh, I also do sort of like question whether technological progress is um, the sole determinant of how we sort of like understand modern sensibility, right? Uh, I guess what's interesting to me about the modern is really it's about how capital enables a kind of like reconfiguration of sort of social hierarchy, right? Which might not lead to always egalitarianism, but what it does, it always inevitably reconfigures social hierarchies. That means everything sort of is upended. And there was, you, you create this agonistic sort of like space where debates sort of like happen, where our values are sort of like contested, and it's this contestation of sort of like values that we characterize very loosely as the modern, or what we characterize as the modern kind of like sensibility. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It also leads to the transformation or reconfiguration of a human nature relationship. Which, which really change how we live with the environment as well. The commodification of nature, the production of second nature, and, and things like that. So absolutely, yeah, capitalism is an important part in this equation. I, oh. oh, a hand. A hand is raised. Last, 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 last Hello, question. sorry. Because you keep talking about technology, I cannot help, I cannot help myself. Because yeah, uh, yeah. this is like my site. Um, I think this is an interesting conversation because you, there is a, sometimes we kind of talk about technology as if it's something out there, right? Very instrumentalist approach as well. And um, 
I would maybe then ask a question. How would you as a historian and how would you as a museum that identifies particular artifacts as sites in which you're going to unpack certain phenomena, how would you deal with this thing which is technology that is very embedded, very invisible? It's not it in and of itself an interesting artifact per se because technology, current technology, like whether this digital technology, right? Tapnari actually is kind of ugly um, and very uniform and very global. But what it does is it kind of, um, first of all, sets for you a framework of how an ecosystem is supposed to look like. It sets for you a framework of value system and it sets for you this also like very geopolitical framework of this notion of if you say smart cities, then smart cities for us is always framed under development and development is always economic development. But smart cities in say countries in Europe is always for responding to particular uh, problems like um, pollution and too much like, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's also this, uh, I don't know how to put it, yeah? It's like a shuttling of one thing to another that is invisible, that you can't really see in and of itself as an artifact or an object to start to unpack certain things. You actually have to take three steps back and examine this as an ecosystem or as, yeah, also as a bio-organic thing, right? That is being shunted from one place to another. So how would you do this, A, as a museum, B, as a site of study, C, as a, and in a way that actually brings out the politics and not instrumentalize it or not see it as either techno-solutionism or techno-determinism or techno-euphoria, but we just live in an age where there is nothing that is so material anymore. We are all kind of cyborgs, right? <laughs> a mini response, a timid response to your big question. Um, it's something I just I just have to mention that the post-human and the post-nature uh, uh, issue is actually part of going to be part of our opening display because we thought we thought I guess our opening display has a section about the contemporary in that sense, and that part is just we couldn't help but like my goodness we have to deal with that aspect. So technology is not going to be a thing. Uh, it's going to pervade everything in that sense in the contemporary section. But um, so we we acquired the eyeball. But guess how we would talk about the Ibo? You know the Sony Ibo, right? The dog, okay, in the 80s. Um, it's, yeah, exactly. So it's actually meant to be, we're going to be talking about it in terms and in light of our loneliness. Okay, so it's actually a very human, psychological sort of... Uh, uh, so it, there are many ways in which we read technology because it is a means to, uh, through many things. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a result, it's, it's a, it results from many, many aspects, not just economics, but we want to bring it to the personal as well. Um, so it'll be on that. So we acquired the eyeball for that purpose, not the only one, but it's the main purpose, main storyline about how, where we are in communication. How are we in touch with one another? We are highly, highly, increasingly reliant on a board, basically. And then we are also, at the moment, struggling with acquiring an app. Not really an app, it's actually a, it's not even an app. It's an open source coded, if you, I think those who are taking part in NTUCCA, you know about Etienne Turpin's uh, Cognicity software, where the idea here is about gathering all the information from social media about flood crisis and management. And so we are trying to discuss how we acquire that because it's open source. What does that mean? It's an unstable, right? It's just going to keep changing. And so uh, we are trying to find how do we show it? How do we show or display software <laughs> like, uh, and the use of it and how it's even designed? So. So these are these are topics, but we thought we still think that it's highly crucial to to acquire to acquire it, as we had already acquired the MOG. But the MOG we acquired it because um, uh, we managed to find the analog version of MOG. So Entity Docomo's um, commission of actually an architect uh, Jun Aoki uh, to actually draw within the grid, design the icon within a grid system. Uh, so we acquired uh, sketches of that. Uh, but just to show, they, they'll be part of this idea of the 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 the. Uh, how da data and communication. So, yeah. Maybe just a quick response given the technological disruption that we're experiencing right now. So, so I think as, as architecture and art historian, I think because, especially as architecture historian, we, are, we tend to look at an object, so we tend to fetishize a, a big object, a, a building. So sometimes we actually forget the context and the stories behind a building. So that's our main challenge is how do we um, 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 talk about the objects and, and the, the kind of stories behind that so that it, it doesn't become a decontextualized and a freestanding uh, autonomous entity? I think that, that is really our challenge. So it's to really put something in larger social context, whether is it aesthetic, whether is it technology, whether is it um, something else? Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, 
sorry. Um, the building is telling us to shut up. <laughs> so, um, but please stay back. Um, all our speakers are still here. Um, they're open to sort of you coming that, uh, coming over to them and asking sort of like more personal sort of questions that you do not raise. You do not dare to sort of like raise your hands to us, uh, but sort of like stay on, hang out with us, and thank you so much for spending the day with us. We're very happy that so many of you sort of turned up, and I hope to sort of like impress upon, um, you know, all uh, uh, Ilham Gallery to sort of like, perhaps sort of like bring in more sort of like architecture talks in the future as well, given that, you know, it's something that is, I guess, popular uh, uh, amongst the Malaysian mission.